أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد Previously we discussed an important classification of hadith there are four primary categories. The first was the Sahih, authentic hadith. The second was the Hassan or good hadith. The third was the dependable or the muwathaq hadith. And the fourth was the weak or da'if hadith. These are the primary classifications of the hadiths that we have. The first one, the authentic Sahih hadith, there is consensus that it's accepted and that we can rely on it. Scholars can issue fatwas based on a sahih hadith. As for the Hassan hadith and the dependable hadith, there are some minor differences. Some previous scholars in the past would not necessarily accept a dependable hadith or a Hassan hadith, but we find that the majority of scholars throughout time, they accept these first three categories of hadith. Yes, the da'if hadith is not a narration or hadith that we can depend on. We need further clues to verify its correctness and authenticity. Today, let's examine some more classifications of hadith. There are other categories for hadith. And this is also important for us to be familiar with because it really impacts and has an effect on the authenticity of the hadith. So one classification of hadith that we have is the musnad or the muttasil hadith. So this first category that we'll examine today is called the musnad or mut Tasil Hadith. The Musnad literally means the supported, the chain that is supported. The Muttasil in Arabic means connected, supported and connected. Basically this means that there is no break in the chain. The Chain is a consecutive connected chain from the person who's mentioning the hadith all the way until the Imam or the Prophet peace be upon them. So this is the definition of a muttasil or musnad hadith. You will find this commonly used. For example, you bring a hadith and as this hadith is being discussed, the question will arise, is this hadith a muttasil hadith? It is a musnad hadith or no. If there is a break in it, then it becomes more difficult to verify its authenticity. Now this classification of hadith, the musnad and the muttasil, this is a criterion for which type of category we discussed last time? The sahih and hasan and dependable, right? All those three, for us to say this is a Sahih Hadith, this is a Hassan Hadith, this is a Muwathaq dependable Hadith, it must be Musnad or Muttasil. If you have a Hadith in which all narrators are Adil, just, upright, truthful, but there's one break in the chain, there's one gap, right? Can you call this a Sahih Hadith? No, you can no longer call it a Sahih Hadith or a dependable hadith, or a Hassan hadith. All these three, the chain must be connected to the Imam. So we see this classification, the Musnad or the Muttasil, this is a, an important condition for any hadith to be Sahih. You cannot have a Sahih chain if there's a break in the chain. So this is the definition of the Musnad and Muttasil, they're pretty much the same thing. 
there are some minor technical differences between them, but for what matters for us, they're pretty much the same. So that's one classification. The second classification of the hadith is the marfu'. Now literally to translate the marfu', it's the lifted or the traced. What does marfu' mean? The marfu' is any hadith which you ascribe to the Imam. The Imam said that, the Imam did that, but you don't give a full chain. We call this marfu'. So if one of the narrators is mentioning something from one of the Imams, and he did not live in the era of that Imam, that narrator says, Imam al-Sadiq said so and so. The Prophet, peace be upon him, did so and so. This is called a marfu' hadith because basically he doesn't provide us his link to the Imam. This in the science of hadith is called a hadith that is marfu'. So when you see scholars saying this hadith is marfu', we know there is a break in it. It's not a connected hadith. The narrators may be all reliable, but the last narrator, right? that the chain ends with, he does not have a chain to the Imam. He's just saying that the Imam said so, but he does not have a direct link to the Imam. We call this hadith marfu'. Many of the hadith that we have are marfu'. You have a solid chain until you reach the last narrator. The last narrator never met the Imam, but he says, Imam al-Sadiq said so and so. This hadith is called marfu'. And a marfu' hadith technically cannot be considered a sahih hadith because of that break in the chain. So you have to look at other clues to verify whether this hadith is correct or not. Any questions about the marfu' hadith? So it would have a chain. So basically part of it you do have a chain. For example, Kulayni narrates this hadith from his teacher from his teacher and then you get a break. Between the teacher of Kulayni and the Imam, there is no connection there. It's just a type of hadith in which you have a break in the chain. That's all we need to know. Yes, there are some technical definitions to it, where exactly is the break in the chain, but what we need to know at this point is that there is a break in the chain. That's what we call a hadith that is marfu'. So would the different schools of thought uh, out there say all of the hadiths, everything that they say would be marfu'? Who? Which, which hadith? Like uh, the, the Sunni school of thought, like all these uh, hadiths in Bukhari or Muslim or somebody just standing up there and saying that uh, this is call of Rasulullah. So would, would that be considered marfu'? If you have a chain, it would not be considered marfu'. So yeah, if there's no chain, then yes, it would be marfu'. But if you take a hadith from the book of Kafi or Bukhari, there's a chain to it. Some hadiths, yeah, even in Kafi you will find that one of the narrators who did not directly meet the Imam, he will say the Imam said so and so. This is a hadith that is marfu'. We cannot call the chain to be sahih. Now Bukhari also gives us its chain from Bukhari all the way up to the Prophet. He provides a chain in his book. So upon, yes, so upon our examination, not all those chains are reliable. But that's not called marfu'. Why? Because he gives you the chain. So and so narrated on the authority of so and so, so and so. It's connected to the time of the Prophet. But we have an issue with some of the narrators. It would be weak. It would be weak, yes, but it's not marfu'. It's, it's a musnad, muttasal hadith. But because one of the narrators is not reliable, it becomes a weak hadith. Marfu' means you have a break in the chain. You don't have a connected chain to the Imam alayhi salam. So you'll hear this word a lot in the science of hadith and the world of hadith. If you hear this hadith is marfu', what does it mean? That's all you need to know. There's a break in the chain. It doesn't go all the way to the Imam alayhi salam. That's what it means. 
So this is another classification of hadith. We'll skip a few over here that we don't really need to know at this point. Let's go to page 29. You have the mudraj. The third type of classification that we have is called the mudraj. The mudraj hadith, hadith is the interposed hadith. What does that mean? This means that sometimes a narrator will narrate to you a hadith, but he'll interject his own words in it. Like sometimes you're telling a story, right? I went to so-and-so scholar, he said this, and then in parentheses you add your own words, either to explain it, to give your opinion, to elaborate. Now throughout history, sometimes this does not become clear to us. Are these the exact words of the Imam? Or now the narrator is inserting his own words. Sometimes in Islamic law, when we're examining a case, we see there's a contradiction between hadiths. Upon close examination of those hadiths, we realize one of the narrators who's quoting the Imam or the Prophet, he added his own words. And because he added his own words, and later on, those who were writing this hadith could not distinguish his words from the words of the Imam. His words became part of the hadith. It created confusion, it created a contradiction. So this type of hadith, we call it a mudraj hadith, an interposed hadith. What does that mean? That means the words of the narrator got mixed with the words of the Imam and we can't really distinguish. Sometimes we have clues, we can distinguish, but sometimes it really becomes difficult to decipher exactly what are the words of the Imam and what are the words of the narrator. Now if we can't distinguish whether the words are the words of the Imam or the words are the words of the narrator, can we accept this as an authentic hadith or no? We cannot. We have a phrase, we don't know. Some parts of it we know belong to the Imam. Some parts of it we know the narrator himself, he interposed his opinion. But we can't distinguish exactly what part of the sentence the Imam said, what part of the sentence or hadith the narrator said. Can we consider this hadith to be an authentic hadith? We cannot, because we're not sure exactly what the Imam said. So if we can differentiate it between which part belongs to the Imam, what he said. We cannot use this hadith, it becomes useless to us. Because only the words of an infallible are binding on us, right? Let me give you an example, let's say someone delivers a message to you from your boss, your master, someone of higher authority sends you a message, the messenger comes and tells you the message, but you don't know exactly what the message is because he changed it, he added some words, he you know rearranged the words or the sentences and now you don't know exactly what the message is. Do you act upon it? You do not act upon it because you're like, I don't know exactly what the message is. I'm confused now because someone added their own words into it. In that case, I cannot act upon this message. I need to know for sure that these are the exact words of my master for me to act upon them. So this hadith, the mudraj hadith, we cannot depend on it unless we go do research and we come to certainty that these are the words of the Imam and these are the words of the narrator. Sometimes we're able to do that, there are clues that, you know, point to us. Yes, sister. When I heard words like one of the Imams, I'm not sure which one, uh, he says that if you hear our command and if you're not sure it's coming from us, uh, you would be given the reward of acting upon it, even if you do act upon it. That hadith you're referring to, there is a hadith that says, if it reaches you that there is a recommended deed to do and that you'll be promised so and so reward for it and you're not sure whether we said it or not, maybe it was made up, it was fabricated and you go ahead and do that good deed, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you the reward 
even if we didn't say it. That's a different thing here. This is saying that if you heard, for example, you know, fasting on the 10th of the month is recommended, or praying a two rak'ah prayer on the beginning of every month is recommended, right? Now fasting in itself is obviously recommended. Prayer in itself is recommended, we have no doubt about that. But a hadith comes in our books and says, if you pray this two unit prayer, on the first Friday of every month, you get so and so reward. And because you want to do this mustahab recommended act, you want to show your obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you end up doing it. The hadith says God out of His generosity will give you that reward, that promised reward in the hadith, even if the hadith was fake, because you made the effort. God will reward you based on the effort that you made, even if it comes out to be a fake hadith. But since it reached you that the Imam said, if you do this prayer, you get so and so reward, Allah does not want to deny you that because you've made the effort. Therefore, because you've had the intention, Allah will reward you. That's different than we're, what we're talking about. That's why those hadiths that you mentioned, if there is an obligation mentioned in them, something binding, a marja' will not issue a fatwa based on that. A marja' will say, do it, it's mustahab, you'll get the reward because the Imams have promised you'll get the reward, but it's not binding, I can't issue any fatwa on it. It's not possible for me to issue a fatwa on. So that's a different thing. Over here we're talking about a hadith that has to do with prayer, fasting, hajj, anything. And we get this hadith from the Imam in which he's describing to us how to do something for instance, or what's halal and what's haram. But we know that the narrator interjected his own opinion and now we're confused, we don't know whether the Imam really said this part or that part. The whole hadith becomes ambiguous to us and we cannot use it. To the same topic, there is another hadith heard that Rasulullah Karim said that do not twist my words, otherwise you will be straight. So the example is given of Abu Huraira, that he added a lot of things just in that, that people will do good in the name of Prophet. So what do we do with that? Yeah, see, the Prophet and the Imams were very clear that it is a big sin for someone to forge a hadith, come up with a hadith and claim that the Prophet said it when he did not say it. Even if you want to, you know, uh, forge a good hadith in your opinion, to encourage people to do good deeds, you don't have that right. This is haram because God shows us His religion. We can't make up hadiths to encourage people to do good deeds. This is an act of lying. So yeah, this is uh, you know an offense in the religion of Islam. So which way do we follow? We follow the okay. Go ahead and do it. God will reward you. Or so now the Prophet is saying, the Prophet is saying in a number of authentic hadiths and the Imams that if a hadith comes to you, if you know that it's forged, okay, that's different. You know this hadith is false, but there's a hadith that has no chain. Let's say the chain is ambiguous. You don't really know whether the Prophet said it or not. He may have said it, he may have not. The Prophet says, even if you end up doing it, it's not an obligation, binding of course, because halal and haram, that which is binding, must only come in an authentic hadith. If I have a weak hadith, I can't issue a fatwa and say, oh people, you're obligated to do this, because I don't have evidence. If the chain is weak, for instance, but let's say I have a hadith that's not talking about halal and haram, it's talking about good deeds. It's talking about a reward promised if you do certain good deeds, which the deeds in themselves they're good. We know that they're good deeds, but the hadith says you get this big thawab for it, this big reward for it. The Prophet says if you did it out of good intention, even if I didn't say it in reality, because you, the one who followed this hadith, you had good intention, I'll give you the reward. That's out of Allah's generosity, because you showed the good intention. Let me give you an example. Let's say, let's say someone in his house, his friend comes up to him and tells him, look, your mom said if you clean up your room, right, she's going to give you so and so. 
He goes and he cleans his room. Turns out his friend was lying. His mom never said that, right? But is it good to clean your room? Does that make your mom happy? Absolutely. So now your mom says, look, I didn't say that. But since you made the effort, I'm going to give you the reward. But what his friend did was, was a sin because he lied. He lied with good intention, but a good intention does not validate a lie. It does not make a lie halal. So that's how we can understand those hadiths. In any case, the mudraj hadith is not a hadith that's false or somebody fabricated, no. The chain is reliable, let's say. We know there's a link to the Imam and the narrator is not lying to us. But as he's saying the hadith, in parentheses he says some words. Now when he said it, the day he said it, it was clear to his audience right? But then throughout history as this was documented, we don't know exactly when his words finished and the words of the Imam started or the other way around. We call this a mudraj hadith, where we don't know what part of the hadith is the Imam's words and which part is the words of the narrator. So the narrator is not lying, no, he's just explaining. You know, sometimes when I'm saying a hadith to you, I'll stop a few seconds to explain what this word means. Later on, somebody who was not present here, maybe he was just reading the transcription of the class, he doesn't know when the words of the hadith stopped and when am I doing my own explanation. So if this creates confusion and we can't decipher, we call this mudraj hadith. Another category of the hadith, is the hadith that is mashhoor. What does mashhoor mean? Renowned, famous, widely recognized. These are all definitions of a mashhoor hadith. A hadith that is mashhoor is a hadith that is widely circulated. It is circulated in many of the books that we have, it is circulated in our books for example. You see those early scholars, the early narrators, they all knew this hadith. However, when you look at the chain of the hadith, it does not have a chain. It has a broken chain, it has a weak chain. Many scholars will implement and act on a famous renowned hadith even if the chain is weak. Why? Because it was so widely circulated that those early companions and scholars had clues that this hadith was authentic. So today when we look at some hadiths, we see they have broken chains, but we see scholars acting upon them. Why? Because they're mashhoor. They're very well known hadiths, and those early scholars had probably much many more sources, they had clues that this was said by the Imam. Just like what? What's that? Mutawatir, no. Mutawatir generates certainty. This does not generate certainty, but it gives you some level of confidence that this hadith, you know, all the companions of the Imam, they were familiar with it, they used to discuss it, it's mentioned, you know, uh, in their books they make references to it, right? Now today I only have one chain to this hadith and it's a broken chain. Because it's a broken chain, it's a weak chain. However, since those early scholars and companions <laughs> widely circulated this hadith, it gives me confidence that the Imam said it because if it was a false hadith, they would have known and they would have made it known to us that this is a false hadith. So many scholars will accept a mashhoor hadith, some scholars won't by the way, there are some maraja' today who are very strict, they're like I don't care if it's mashhoor or not, I need a solid chain. If I don't see a solid chain, I'm not going to act upon it. So there's some differences, but I would say the majority of scholars throughout history would act upon a mashhoor hadith. So what is the criteria for it being mashhoor, just being mentioned in a couple of sources? No, so the criteria, first of all, you don't look at books published today. That's not an indicator. Go back a thousand years ago, during the time of Kulayni, Saduq, Tusi, right? 
examine the books at the time and see the scholars at the time, how did they deal with this hadith? You'll find that this hadith at that time, Shaykh Al-Tusi for example, he's acted upon it. Kulaini has acted upon it. Saduq has acted upon it. It was common. It was a very well-known hadith that they acted upon. But today when you open our books, you only see one hadith in the book of Kafi for example, that mentions this issue which they acted upon. And when you look at the chain, it's a broken chain. But because all those scholars were aware of this hadith, they acted upon it, and it was just a famous hadith amongst, amongst them. In that case, some scholars will say, I accept this hadith. So it's good enough for me to issue a fatwa on because it's a renowned hadith, it's a, it's a well-established famous hadith, even if I don't have a chain to it. But I'll trust those early companions who widely circulated it. Because when something becomes widely circulated, right, it gives you confidence that the Imam probably did say it, otherwise how did this get widely circulated? If it was an, uh, uh, you know, a clearly false hadith, you would, you would have seen the pious companions you know, making that known to us. They would have attacked this hadith, they would have given a stance against this hadith. So this is the meaning of mashhur. Do all scholars accept a hadith that is mashhur? No. Most of them do, but you'll have some maraja' today who are strict, who will not necessarily accept a mashhur hadith. You tell them this hadith is mashhur, he's like, I don't care, let it be mashhur. I, between me and God, I can't verify its authenticity. I don't see that solid chain. Another classification of the hadith is the musahhaf. I know some of these sound similar. Musahhaf. What does musahhaf mean? Musahhaf basically means misspelled. Especially during that time, you didn't have, you know, typewriters or any standardized way of writing. Each scribe would write according to his own style and his own grammatical, you know, style. So oftentimes you had spelling errors in some of those hadiths. Such as, for example, the dots would be misplaced, some letters would be misplaced, and an example is this, the word hariz would change into jarir, if you just change the dots. Let me write that so this becomes clear to us. So we have the word hariz, or hariz, depends how you pronounce it. That's the name of one of the companions of Imam Sadiq right, hariz. Now back then, even the dot system was not standardized. Remember, initially the Arabic language had no dots. Later the dots were added to distinguish the letters. So sometimes as you're writing, a scribe is writing, you would see some spelling mistakes. You would see the dot here instead of there. Either he misplaced the dot, someone who came after to copy those words misplaced it, so you get now Jarir. Jarir is now a different person, that's a different name. One little dot changed the word. So this is a misplaced hadith and sometimes you see some of our narrations, you see a problem with them. You know, the, the chain doesn't make sense, some words don't make sense and you're wondering what's going on with this chain, you know. We don't have a person at this you know, in this group of narrators whose name is Jarir. Who's Jarir? And now some scholars, if they don't do enough research, they'll say, oh, this is a, an anonymous chain, it's a weak chain, let's throw it out. Because Jarir, I don't know who Jarir is. But when you, you know, exa examine this hadith closely, you realize there are clues that the scribes made a mistake. It's not Jarir, it's Hariz. And hadith is reliable, which makes the entire chain reliable. So this really makes a difference. Oftentimes you will come across some hadiths, 
you'll see scholars accepting the hadith, some don't. You ask those who don't, they'll tell you this is an anonymous, anonymous chain, it's not a sahih chain. You ask the scholars who accept the hadith, you're like, then how did you implement the hadith? They're like, initially it seemed like it was anonymous. We did further research, we realized there was a spelling error in the hadith. So we fixed that error and that makes the hadith authentic. So this is very important to know if the hadith has a spelling error or not. Now this requires a very lengthy process to go and look at those early you know, manuscripts and sources to figure out whether the hadith is misspelled or not. In any case, whenever you have a hadith in which there's the possibility that there are some errors, spelling errors, we call this musahhaf, the misspelled hadith. So you'll find some scholars in their books of Islamic law coming across a hadith, they'll tell you this hadith is musahhaf. So we have to, you know, figure out where the error is. So if you hear that phrase musahhaf, know that the hadith, there are some spelling errors in it and we have to see what those mistakes are and see how to correct them. Yes, there are a number of hadiths, not many, but there are some hadiths, even in the book of Kafi, that, you know, scholars have uh, said they are musahhaf. Now we don't know where the error came from, that also requires research. Was it the first narrator, the last narrator, Kulaini himself, or no, we don't have the book of Kulaini himself, we have the version of those who came and made copies of the book of Kulaini. Maybe those scribes misspelled some words. Because remember back then there was no copy machine. So the book of Kafi that we have today, it's a specific version. Maybe the one who copied that version, reproduced that version, he made the mistake. We don't know. But sometimes we do know. We can some, make some analogies, historical analogies in order to figure out where the spelling error is. So yeah, we do have in our books hadiths that are like that. And this is a common term that you'll hear in Islamic law. This hadith is musahhaf, it's misspelled and it should be this way. You see many maraja actually fixing some hadiths and saying this is an error, it cannot be this way. Or sometimes a word comes in the hadith that goes against grammar laws in Arabic or it does not follow an accepted form in Arabic. So the manja will say this is musahhaf, you know, we don't have such a form in Arabic. So there's definitely a mistake. Maybe one of the narrators was not Arab, so he did not know the laws of grammar, grammar well and when he was telling the hadith he made that mistake or maybe the, it was the scribes, could be a number of possibilities but we do actually have such hadiths. So we have to look at them closely. So these are some classifications of hadith, let's examine some more. There are many of course over here but we don't need to know all of these for now. On page 30 under heading number 6, we see some more classifications of hadith. One other classification that we have here is the hadith that is mawquf. Basically in the hadith that is mawquf, it's not clear who's the one who's saying the hadith. So we have the mawquf over here. The linguistic translation of mawquf is the stopped hadith. So over here basically we have a chain that does not end at the Imam alayhi salam, it ends at one of the companions. Zurara said this, Muhammad ibn Muslim said that. Does that have authority? Not really, maybe Zurara is giving his own opinion. So a hadith that is maqtu' does not have authority because only the opinion of the Imam and the Prophet has authority over us, not the opinion of a companion. 
Sorry, that's mawkuf or mawkuf? That's mawkuf, the first one. This is the tradition about a statement or an action narrated on the authority of the companion of a ma'sum. So this type of hadith is not authoritative, even if the chain of transmission is sound, we have a perfect chain, because the origin is not a ma'sum. You have a direct chain to Zurara, and Zurara is not telling us what the Imam said, he's giving us his own opinion. He says, for example, you should do this. Well, you should do this, whose opinion is that? That could be his opinion. We're not sure this is the opinion of the Imam. So this hadith which is maqtu' we cannot really rely on it. You'll find this sometimes in our books of hadith. One of those narrators, his name is Suma'a. Suma'a is known for this. He doesn't tell you who's he narrating from. Suma'a, in a number of his hadiths, he says, Qala. He said that when you pray, do this. When you fast, do this. But he doesn't tell you who. Who's, who's who qala? Who said? The Imam said. Somebody else said. He doesn't make it clear to us. Now, some scholars, upon their research, they say we've done research and it seems he's referring to Imam Sadiq salam. There are clues, but other scholars say we don't know. We do not know if he's narrating from Imam Sadiq because he's not telling us who. He has to say the source, but he's not mentioning the source. This would be maqtu' because you don't know who's the one who's saying this opinion. So that sometimes happens. Sometimes the Shia, not to get the Imams in trouble, they would do that. They're in a gathering and they're asked about the opinion, the correct opinion, and they said, oh, he says this. Now to those Shia, it was close, it was clear who they're referring to. You know, amongst them it was clear that Imam al-Sadiq for example said that, but they did, did not want to say this publicly. Now the one who heard that hadith recorded it for us, he recorded it as he heard it, and when it was said, the source was not given. Who said? Sometimes this creates confusion for us. Sometimes we don't have clues to really know whether the Imam said this or not. So if hadith is maqtu' and we don't have clues that the Imam is the one who actually said it, we cannot use this hadith. There are some hadiths actually like that. We have a number of hadiths that are maqtu'. You know a lot of these hadiths that you see on social media for instance, they're maqtu'. Their statements, we don't know whether the Imam السلام, said it, a companion said it, a wise person said it, a philosopher said it, we don't know. This is maqtu'. We don't know if this actually goes to the Imam السلام. This is maqtu'. Sorry. Maqtu'. It's, it's also maqtu' because it has a break. Because the maqtu' means the hadith that has a break in the chain, but it's maqtu'. We also don't know who said it. There are some statements, you don't know who's the one who said them. They're famous, they're circulated, right? But we don't know. Do they go back to a scholar? Maybe one of the scholars said it and then people thought it was the Imam who said it. Maybe it was a philosopher, wise man who said it, we don't know. So that sometimes happens. And, uh, and when you examine some of these hadiths, you realize, you know what? We don't have any sources that demonstrate the Imam said it. And sometimes you'll go back and you'll find, oh, so-and-so philosopher actually is the one who said this statement and then people thought the Imam السلام, said it. So this is also one classification of hadith. The final one that we'll examine here is the mawdu'. What does mawdu' mean? The mawdu' hadith is the fabricated hadith. And there are many fabricated hadiths. The entire hadith is just fabricated, mawdu'. There are some people who came after the Prophet and the Imams. They were employed by the governments of the time, paid, paid the top money to forge hadiths. For instance, Muawiyah, the corrupt Umayyad leader, some of those companions of the Prophet who sold their religion for cheap, Sometimes Muawiyah would pay them 1,000 golden coins just to make up a hadith. 
Some of them would negotiate. They're like, no, give us more for us to make up that hadith for you. He would go up to 10,000. One of those companions, the Muawiyah gave him 100,000 dinars, 100,000 golden coins just to make up a hadith. You know, either a hadith that slanders Ahlul Bayt or a hadith that elevates the status of Bani Sufyan, the children of Sufyan and Muawiyah or the Umayyads. Do we know who was he? Yes, many of them. Abu Huraira was one of them. He was paid to forge, but there were others too. There are, there are many who actually were employed by Muawiyah and others, and we have their names mentioned in our books, yes. In the group, we can discuss some of those names and some of the incidents, you know, the exact hadiths that they actually fabricated. We have that documented in history. So this hadith is just called Mawdu'ah. Now to summarize all of these classifications, whenever you have a weakness in a chain, a broken chain, someone who's not reliable, can you automatically say the hadith is weak or no? See we have two things, we have a chain, the senad we call it in Arabic, and we have the hadith itself, the text of the hadith, or we call it the metan. These classifications that we talked about, they primarily apply to the chain. This chain is not reliable, this chain is weak, but does a weak chain necessarily mean that the text itself is weak? No, it does not. For you to say that the hadith, this text is weak, only an expert scholar has the authority to say something like that. Because you have to look at all those clues out there and you have to see the hadith, is it compatible with the Quran? Is it compatible with the intellect? Is it compatible with other hadiths? Is it compatible with the spirit of Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them? Once you go through all of that and you still see the hadith to be problematic, it goes against the teachings of the Quran, against the teachings of the Prophet, against the teachings of the Imams, it goes against the justice of God, right? Then you would say, okay, this hadith is a weak hadith. Not only is the chain weak, but the hadith itself is weak and you reject it outright. Only a qualified scholar can do that. So yes, while one of the most important clues that determines whether a hadith is accepted or not is the chain. And we examined how we can get an authentic chain, how we can get a weak chain. But that's not the only factor that determines whether a hadith is correct or not. You could have a hadith with a broken chain, with a weak chain, yet the hadith is still sound and it's still good and it's still implemented by the scholars. So that really requires an expert to, deter, to make that determination. So we have two extremes. We have you know, some types of Muslims, any hadith that they see on the internet, on social media, they'll accept it as a hadith and they'll act upon it. Wrong. You have to verify which source it's coming from. Is it reliable or not? And then you have those who will tell you, oh, as long as I don't have a perfect sahih chain, I'm not going to even look at the hadith wrong because the chain is only one factor, it's only one clue. You have to look at other clues. So the correct approach is not to automatically dismiss any hadith that has no chain, but you need to do further research. And that research starts by looking at the source. Is there a source to this hadith or no? And these days we have all these softwares and applications that really make it easy for us to search. Whenever there's a hadith, I have an app, I can go on that app and put the text of the hadith to see in the 5,000 books or so that we have, is this found or not? If I see a reliable source for it, that's a very good indication that this could be a reliable hadith, do a little bit more research about it. But if I don't find it anywhere, in none of our books, then that's a strong indication that probably this hadith was just you know either fabricated or this exact text is not a, it's not something that the imams have said maybe someone 
you know, is taking the teachings from a number of hadiths and putting it in his own words, for instance. So we have to find that middle ground. We don't dismiss all hadiths, nor do we accept all hadiths. We have to do research. So whenever you come across a hadith and you have doubts about its sources, search, see where is it? Is it in Kafi? If you find it in the book of Kafi, fine. Be comfortable that at least you have a valid source. Then examine the hadith, what kind of content? If the content is very significant and sensitive and important, has to do with the pillars of faith, it has to do with you know, something that you will act upon, then you have to examine the chain and other clues. But if it's just a moral hadith, a nice teaching, a nice story mentioned in it, right? Or you just take some lessons from it, you don't have to do all that research, that's fine. As long as you are getting it from a trusted source, that should be enough. So with that we finish these types of classifications. Let's go to chapter 2 and talk about something very important, which is whose transmission do we accept? Whose hadith do we accept? There are eight criteria for us to consider when it comes to accepting a hadith. Now before we examine these criteria, there's one important point here. Some scholars and even today you'll find some uneducated people, they do bring this up. But some scholars in the past, they have said, for you to go and investigate about the lives of these companions and narrators, to see whether they're reliable or not, to do that is haram. Why? Can anyone guess why that would be haram? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Some scholars said, you know, this process of going and reading the biography of these companions and narrators to research their life to see if they were reliable or not reliable, right? This process, this investigation in itself is haram, it's not permissible. Some very, a very small minority of scholars have said that. Why do you think that would be the case? Any guesses? What's that? So you, wouldn't doubt. so you wouldn't doubt? Well, we need to have certainty in our faith. Doubt is no good. So by researching, we're actually getting certainty. So what's their problem? Just yes. Maybe because we could end up backbiting. Exactly. Because this is a type of backbiting. When you go and you read about these narrators and say, oh, he was a liar, he was not pious, he did this, he did that. That's backbiting, right? Of course, if it's not true, then that's accusation. See, what is backbiting? When there's someone, your friend, right? You go and talk about the faults of your friend. That's backbiting. Right? <laughs> so we're talking about the faults of these narrators. Oh, this narrator, you, you, when you want to know whether a hadith is sahih, you're looking for faults. That's exactly what you're doing. You're reading historical accounts, you're trying to find a fault in that narrator, right? Once you find a major fault, then you say, okay, I will no, no longer accept this hadith. So this is an, an, a way of backbiting. Ghibah in Islam, one definition of it is backbiting. So how do you know? Because you're talking about the faults of other human beings and discussing the faults of other human beings, according to this minority of scholars, is wrong. You know, you should be respectful to others, you shouldn't come and gossip and talk about people's faults, right? The author says this is not a valid concern because we over here need to verify these hadith which establish our religion. When it comes to establishing your religion, you need to know your source. You're not backbiting, you're not gossiping. You're basically researching whether this source is correct or not and there's a verse in the Qur'an. The Qur'an says when somebody brings you news, right? And that person is uh, fasiq, let's say sinful, bad, not practicing, not known to be truthful, the Qur'an says then investigate. Don't just take anybody's report. So you have to actually investigate. Now yes, the, the scholar says, the, those scholars who do investigate, they have to be very careful. 
you have to try your best, do diligence, not to be unfair to a reporter. Because some scholars, you know, the minute you see something, you quickly pass a judgment and say, oh, this narrator is dismissed, he's bad and that's it. He says, no, you have to be very careful because you don't want to defame any reporter, right? So you have to really examine the clues and be certain of your assessment. Don't just, you know, conjecture and make up your own assessments here or rush to your assessments, don't rush. Before you make that assessment and judgment, you have to be extra careful. Otherwise, you'll be doing injustice to that reporter. On the day of judgment, Allah will tell you that reporter was reliable, but because there was somebody who accused him and you did not actually do research to see whether that witness was, you know, correct or not, you defamed that reporter. You considered him to be weak. You considered him to be unreliable. And Allah will hold us accountable for that. So the author says, we do have to do that research, but we have to be careful. Such that you've done your due diligence, that's all. Don't rush to the judgment or assessment. So that was the thing in regards to some Shia scholars mentioning the fact that Some of them had an issue with that, like some Akhbaris, right. they didn't like the fact that we're going and investigating about the lives of each of these companions. They're like, you know, Kulaini and all these books, they're just authentic, just accept it. Don't do that research, you don't need to do it. So other schools of thought, as, as far as uh, the Sunni school of thought, is it true that a lot of them discourage from you to go and research because then you could get confused or... They discourage what? you from doing research on what? On w w whatever is being preached uh, by their Imams at the mosque and whatnot, for them to not... Do yes, they do actually... Yes, they do discourage that. You will find in many of them, in many of their mosques, many of their societies, they will discourage their laymen from going and researching because they don't want them to know the truth. Because once you investigate, you start challenging what they say and they don't want to be challenged. So yes, some of those extremists actually discourage their um, congregations from researching. But this has nothing to do with, you know, the issue of gossip or backbiting, this is just because they don't want them to know the truth. They just want the, them to accept exactly what they're saying. Don't challenge us. You'll find that actually in many, many societies, definitely. Therefore, we are allowed to do this research because this is based on our religion and you need to know from which source you get your religion from. So that does not fall under the category of backbiting or gossiping or being unfair to, you know, someone, or ruining someone's reputation, right? This does not fall under that category. So look at, let's look at some of these criteria. The first criteria is that the person who's giving you the hadith, that narrator from whom you're getting the hadith, they have to have, they have to meet certain conditions. Number one is that they have to be Muslim. There is consensus amongst the scholars of hadith and Islamic law that the one narrating the hadith and giving it to you must be Muslim. Number two, he must possess maturity. What do we mean by that? He must have achieved puberty. So we cannot accept the hadith of a boy, a five-year-old boy for example, a six-year-old girl for example who narrates the hadith. In the science of hadith, we cannot accept their hadith because one of the criteria for the acceptance of hadith is what? For that person who's transmitting the hadith to be baligh. Baligh means mature or someone who has achieved puberty. That's the second one. Number two, the person must be sane. So we do not accept the hadith of the one who's mentally disturbed, one who's mentally insane for instance. Their hadiths are disregarded. So if there is someone who's known to have some mental issues for instance, we cannot rely on their hadith because there is a possibility that the hadith they're delivering to us is not accurate. So these are some general conditions. Another condition we briefly spoke about last week, adala, to be just and upright. Is that necessary or no? 
Some scholars say yes, it's necessary. Why are the majority of scholars today say no? As long as that person is trustworthy, even if they're not just, even if sometimes, you know, they committed sins, they were not upright, and this was known to the public, but as long as we know they're truthful in what they say, then we can trust their hadith. So this is an area of disagreement. Today scholars, the majority of scholars in Maraja today, they say the narrator does not have to be just or adil. As long as he's reliable, that's fine. Another condition is accuracy. You have someone who's Muslim, who's uh, an adult, who's perfectly sane, who's just, does not sin, is righteous, but they're not very accurate with what they deliver. This could go back to a number of reasons. One of them is a weak memory, right? Someone may be a very righteous good person, but they have weak memory so they forget details. Or some people just have the habit and they don't mean ill. They think somebody told them, you know, this wording, whereas you'll figure out they were adding their own words. So they heard about that event, right? And they'll tell you as if it's fact, but their mind is actually adding a lot, of, a lot of words, a lot of details, and they're not even aware of it. They don't do this deliberately, they're not lying, but some people are just like that. Especially if some time has passed, and you're trying to recall from something from many years ago, right? Your mind just adds certain things that were not said to you by that person. Or sometimes your analysis gets, you know, mixed with the facts. So you're narrating the incident as if it's a fact that you witnessed, but half of it is actually your own analysis of that event. This happens quite frequently. So one of the things that we have to look out for when we're examining the life of a narrator and those people who witnessed about him, they have to also tell us that he was accurate. You could rely on his words. He's reliable, you know, just being pious is not enough. You have some pious people, but they're not necessarily accurate. So that's one criteria. Another criteria that scholars have discussed is the belief of that person. Does that person have to have the correct beliefs? Uh, you know, a 12 verse Shia or no? The majority of scholars say no. As long as that person is reliable, we accept their hadith, and what do we classify their hadith to be? Dependable, the muathaq, right? So the dependable hadith is the one, all the narrators are reliable, but at least one of them has a corrupt belief system, like the waqifis for instance, or some others. So these are some general requirements about a hadith. What about masculinity? Like you'll find maybe in some schools of thought, and some other religions. What about masculinity? Does the narrator have to be a male, a man? No, it does not. So a woman can narrate a hadith and her hadith is equally accepted like that of a man. What about freedom? Can a slave narrate a hadith? Yes, a slave who was owned by someone at the time, if he or she narrates the hadith, we accept their hadith if they're reliable. What about your knowledge of Islamic law. Do you have to be knowledgeable about hadith, about Islamic law, about Arabic? Do you have to be an expert in Arabic for us to accept your hadith? No, none of these are, are not requirements. So if someone does not know anything about Islamic law, but he tells you, I went, I met the Imam and he said this, and if he's reliable, we accept his hadith because he's just narrating to you. It's just narrating to you what the Imam said. You don't need any prior knowledge of Islam, for you to be a narrator. Okay, he doesn't have to be an expert in the Arabic language where he knows all the grammar rules and every you know letter and harakah and vowel, you don't need to know that. As long as this person says this is what the Imam said, you accept his word. Maybe someone translated for him, we don't know. Maybe the Imam somehow made it clearly understood for him. So this person, of course they have to know Arabic, but they don't have to be experts in, you know, in, in the Arabic language. 
What about sight? Some schools of thought have said we do not expi we do not accept the hadith of a blind person. Is that acceptable or no? No, that is not acceptable. One of the criteria of hadith is not for a person to be seeing. And we actually have a number of narrators in our Shia traditions like Abu Basir who was blind. He was actually blind and he narrates many, many hadiths from Imam Sadiq and we accept his hadith. So just because somebody was blind does not mean that we dismiss their hadith. Now why does this, you know, objection come? Maybe some will say, okay, this blind person, but how does he know the Imam said it? Maybe somebody else was saying it and he thought the Imam was saying it because he can't physically see the Imam. We don't accept that assessment, you know. If, if someone's reliable, they know that this is the Imam talking to them. They're familiar with the voice of the Imam. They, they, we could trust them, you know, to that extent. Where it's somebody's not fooling them that, hey, I'm the Imam and listen to this hadith and you can't see me but here's my voice, you know. We can trust them to that point. So these are some general criteria that are mentioned about the hadith. We'll examine some more next week inshallah. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa alihi al-tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad.